would just like to say I'm really excited for this panel this morning. Um, I was just talking to Mr. Mayberry, David Mayberry, and I'm a new, one of the newest um, residents of Oxford County, and though I'm not in South Oxford, um, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say about the county because they're doing some really exciting things. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation of kind of connecting academia um, with what's, what's going on in the real world. So, so this is very, very promising. So without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jody, who's going to be moderating all of our keynotes this morning. So thank you. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this panel. Um, I'm super excited about the conversation we're going to have because we've spent three days together as a society of folks engaged in the study of ecological economics. Some of us who identify as ecological economists and others of us who are transdisciplinary and like to dabble. And this is one of the places that we dabble. Uh, but there are folks in the real world who are having the same responses to the ecological and social crises of our times and are in their communities doing something about it. And so this panel is really an opportunity to engage uh, with actual humans <laughs> out doing the work, and I'll introduce folks in a moment, but also to engage from a perspective that when we leave our academic circles uh, and the theories that we hold and the, the analyses that we bring, uh, it's really our job also to make those analyses matter to folks because at the end of the day, every single person on this planet who's awake and aware is concerned about the same life and death issues. Uh, and so I want you to listen to our panelists from a place of curiosity about how your scholarship is or is not engaging with the concerns, the ideas, uh, the values, the fears, and the hopes that are uh, standing behind the people who get behind the people who are doing this good work because each of these people represent a constituency of some kind. So I'm gonna introduce folks so you know who we're with here. I'm gonna start uh, on the far side of the stage. We have Stephen Quilly, uh, and he is a, uh, from a Quaker background, now more of a heathen, plays the banjo, but not as well as his kids. And we have Hannah Reinlich, currently learning and engaging manager of the Canadian Community Economic Development Network. She's also a poet and an aspiring accomplice. And uh, we have next to Hannah, we've got Paul Gregory, who's director of outreach from the Green Party of Canada, who deserves a medal of honor for sitting through intense <laughs> academic discussion and debate, trying to figure out how to make that relevant to his life and, and his work, and he'll speak more to that. And then I have next to me here esteemed farmer David Mayberry, who is currently the mayor of Southwest Oxford. He's a retired farmer and his son uh, has successfully successioned into the family business. He's married with four kids, seven grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. So uh, the program for today, we're gonna get the conversation set up by Stephen. Uh, he's getting 25 firm minutes. Uh, then we're gonna pull the plug and move on to Hannah, uh, uh, sorry, to Paul Gregory next, who's going to, oh, I mixed that up, we changed the order. We're gonna start with Paul. Paul's gonna set up the question why we're having this conversation, why he's interested in having this conversation. Stephen is then gonna provide us with some framing over a 25 minute period. We're going to then move to Hannah, who's going to speak from her experience as a person working in the cooperative sector, but more broadly as a person working uh, across nations and across circles. And then we're going to hear finally from Mayor Mayberry, who's going to blow our minds with the incredible things that are happening in his community. So without further ado, I'm welcoming Paul Gregory to the stage. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, the Canadian Society for Economic, Ecological Economic Conference. It's my first time ever, and uh, I've always kind of, I've always respected the work of folks like yourself and uh, how much time and energy you've committed to the cause, just like myself, and David, you know, we're all working towards the same cause. So um, I, I take my hat off to you. As you know, the IPCC is basically saying now that we have 11 years to do this. So in political terms, that's another three election cycles. And then for 
for me personally, working at the Green Party of Canada, we have another 150 days before the next election. So, you know, to put it into some context of just how urgent this is, uh, that's the way I've been looking at. So currently we at the Green Party are in the final stages of putting together our policies and our platform. And we'll be sharing that with Canadians in the uh, few coming months. So as Greens, we are the party working with solution providers across the country to address many of the issues that are important to Canadians, such as global warming, um, is one of the most pressing to the Greens. Um, in Ottawa, the word on the street is that the election will be, um, if things maintain course, will be about global warming. And the, w the way the Liberals are currently framing their narrative is it'll be putting a price on pollution. The Greens want to put forward the best possible plan to reach our targets set out in the Paris Agreement with a whole suite of solutions. The solutions are there. What we are missing currently is the political will. Um, part of my object objective in attending this conference this week was to find solutions um, that folks like yourself in the room are working on and that could help strengthen our platform and that we could put forward to the Canadian public. So it's, you know, it's a good way to bridge the great work that you're doing, putting it into policies, platforms, and then having Canadians vote on it. So I'm hoping to start a dialogue with many of you. I've already started over the last few days and is exchanging business cards, so I'm you know, hoping to be able to work. Um, and I also, uh, an observation was, you know, to keep this as nonpartisan as possible, since I'm one of the only political parties here, like, I highly recommend all of you getting involved in the political system. I've only been with the Greens for five years now and coming from uh, different NGOs throughout that. But what I realized was a lot of people don't really know how the political system works. So I, I really feel like if, if you're kind of getting that frustration, like how do we move this forward? It's, it's a great way, like both provincially and federally, to, to get involved in your local EDAs. Um, so switching gears, I just wanted to point out that uh, Dr. Quilly's presentation it has nothing to do with the Green Party whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, and the thing is, I was a student of his, and I came from a conference, and I, uh, we shared a bottle of whiskey. And, you know, academics and alcohol don't mix, as they say. So I was asking, just where the Greens are always have that 6% of the vote, I was like, how can we reach out to a bigger audience? And I think this is part of the, possibly the inspiration of part of his presentation is how to reach a wider audience just outside of that 6% of the Greens that always vote for us. So, but I'm happy to say right now that nationally we're polling 12%, so maybe our conversation works, I don't know. And, uh, and we're as high as 25% in British Columbia, so things are, are really good. So that, that'll give us official party status if we can maintain those numbers. And then hopefully, like you're seeing in British Columbia and in Prince Edward Island, that we can help uh, you know, balance the power and take some of these ideas, again, that you're feeding us. Uh, you know, to be able to implement into the larger scale. So uh, I appreciate your time, appreciate your work, and uh, it's been a great conference so far. So thank you. So how do I get this up? Just press the green. Oh, there we go. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I just want to thank Katie for doing all my PowerPoint. She's wonderful with PowerPoint. The other person I want to thank <laughs> is I want to thank uh, Sophie and the committee because they've done a really fantastic job. <laughs> and it's a really tough gig. It's a tough gig organizing a conference because you get all the shit and you get all the emotional stress and you know sometimes um, the people are too busy to appreciate you. So um, props or whatever the young people say these days. Um, so don't panic, this is just a thought experiment, that's the first thing. Um, this came out of a bottle of whiskey, and, and, and I, I just said, well, what would it take to get rednecks, Mennonites, petrol heads, um, that's guys who like engines, I don't know if you have that word here, um, to vote green. Um, the first observation I want to make, which is maybe slightly difficult, is that this is a really rarefied atmosphere, okay? There's nobody in this room who doesn't identify as a feminist or, or, or would, would say that they, they would have problems with the, the discourse of decolonization or indigenization or trans politics or anything like that. All right? That's all taken for granted in this room. But if you walked from here to BC, 
and talk to someone every quarter of a mile, a random stranger, if you're one of those weird people, you'd probably find 10 people along the way who felt comfortable in this room. And that's really important to um, remember. Um, and then just a little bit of credentialism, because uh, I think someone was comparing me to Joseph Goebbels yesterday. Um, <laughs> I've been doing this. I've sat in conferences like this all my life for the last 35 years. I started out in the CND and the freeze movement. My mum was a, a, the, a Quaker in the women's uh, peace camp at Greenham Common. Um, I was campaigning against the arms trade at university. I was campaigns officer of the Labour Party. Um, I was sitting with Sheila Rowbottom and uh, Hilary Wainwright on the steering committee of the Socialist Society. I helped set up the Red Green Network, which was getting socialists and greens together, uh, you know, at the fringes of the Labour Party. In the early 1990s, I was uh, on the Basic Income European Network. So I was doing all this. I kind of dropped out in the 90s and went mushing for a while because I got depressed. And then the Editorod dried up and they didn't have snow one year and I thought I'd better get back in. So I've come back in and I've been doing all that and I, 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 I see repeating patterns. And, uh, and the patterns are that you get a lot of activism and you get a lot of ideas and it's very, very difficult to tip um, the system. And one of the problems is the fact that we're always working in these bubbles and never more so than now, the political system, I can't remember a time, even during the miners' strike in Britain, where the political system has been so polarized, right? And if um, ecological economists and, 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 and Greens are looking at the other side of the political spectrum and just seeing the enemy, then um, we'll get absolutely nowhere. So I, and when I came, came here to 2012, I was kind of quite comfortable with myself and thought myself quite right on and a kind of all-round pretty decent person. And then Nikki wanted to homeschool, so we're homeschooling in rural Ontario. Have any of you ever been to rural Ontario? It's about like five miles in that direction. <laughs> um, you you want to try go there sometime. And we started doing this kind of, um, we started doing this, oh, it's, oh that one. Um, we started doing this, this form of um, step dancing. The kids were doing traditional music. And we started talking to these other homeschools. And it was a kind of freaky for me, because suddenly I was meeting the kind of Christians that you don't really find in Britain, you know, flat earthers and creationists and people who read the Bible. I mean, they're very rare in Britain. And suddenly I discovered <laughs> that I was a bit of a bigot, right? And at first I was kind of had all my, my defenses were up and the antibodies were coming out and, and it was all a bit... Uh, uh, but then I got talking to them and I discovered that most of them are all right. And if you're hanging out in these fiddle contests, then, you know, you talk creation science and everyone's happy. It's good. Um, and... And I discovered that, that, that actually I'd been living my whole life in, a, in, in a more of a bubble than I thought I had. So this is... This is um <laughs> That's just to buy a bit of sympathy, all right? That's my kids. You can see them later on. But we do that every bloody weekend throughout the summer. We're going to these fiddle camps and meeting all these kind of strange people. And none of them, they're all good people, and none of them, not a single one, especially Frank, if you're watching online, Frank, would feel comfortable in this room, all right? A lot of them would vote Trump if they got the, the, the chance. They definitely vote for uh, Ford. But they're good people. They're really, really good people. So there is a question. There's a lot of them out there. The, the, the Tories have just got a landslide in Alberta. The, you all know what's going on in Britain, which is <laughs> just fantastic. I can't decide whether to watch Liverpool or, uh, <laughs> or, or Farage. But so <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> it's good TV. So... This constituency here, right, they, you don't automatically think of them as people, our constituency, and yet they're people that you have to grapple with. They're real people, and they're not very far away. What about these guys? If you want low carbon, these guys put us to shame, right? The, the, their kids live within a, a, a radius of about 25 miles. They're, low, they're pacifists as well. And they're even kind of quite, they're probably like my Quaker ancestors 300 years ago, but they're not green. They're not feminist. Uh, they're not much on animal rights if you go and speak to some of the horses. And, um, and the, you know, they're settlers, right? So it's, it's a problem. Um, okay, a Dutch auction. I was going to do a Dutch auction. But basically, does anyone give us a 1,000 years to sort this problem out? No. 500 years. 100 years. 12 years, was it, IPC? 12 years. All right. Or who thinks we should have done it yesterday? We've got no time at all. And what we're trying to do is to the biggest transformation on the widest scale of the greatest scope that's ever been tried in history. And if you know any history, you could think, well, what are the precedents? Well, you could think about the Manhattan Project or Sputnik. 
this total concentration of resources, especially the Soviet space program, directed at one goal, right? So if the problem was, um, you know, fusion, and that was going to solve all the problems, then maybe that would be the way to go. And we could look at those precedents and think, well, it's game on. But actually, what we're about is a much, much broader thing. It's about values. It's about the structure of families. It's about the nature of the economy. It's about the relationship between North and South. All of these things, it's a total transformation. The nearest parallel for such a total change was the Soviet Union, right? Not very uh, well thought of these days, but during the 1930s, working class people in Russia loved Stalin, and for good reason. He built an industrial base in 10 years which beat the Wehrmacht. It doesn't matter what the Brits or the Americans say, uh, it was the Russians what won the war, and they won it on the Eastern Front, and they won it by outproducing, producing the best tanks of the Second World War in the greatest numbers. But what a bloody cost. Millions of people, tens of millions of people dying, 20 million people dying in the war, and for an economy which by the 1970s was run into the ground. Right? So I get nervous when I hear people just sort of blithely saying, because I've been doing it all my life. I was a you know, very hysterical, <laughs> and it was. I am a very, I was even more hysterical in my early 20s as an activist, and I was a socialist and doing all that kind of stuff. But, um, but there isn't actually an alternative political economy that's shown to work. I was in Berlin when the wall came down. I feel like Forrest Gump. I've been everywhere. Um, I was in Berlin. Well, actually, I wasn't. I left to go and fall in love back at home and miss the bloody party, but whatever. I was there two weeks before. Anyway, so the wall came down. And what that should, what that should tell you is that the, 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 the idea that there was a, there was a straightforward, off-the-peg political economy for a modernity which is not capitalist and exploitative and anti-environmental, that died in 1989, and we're still dealing with the consequence of that. And we've got 13, 12 years, whatever, to, to, to work out a new one, all right? So um, if you're doing that, if you're involved in that process, one th other thing that you can learn from 20th century history is that you need to enroll the, at least the majority. You're not going to get everyone, right? But if you can get Frank, if you're watching Frank, he's already stepping away from his TV. He's quite superstitious. If you can get Frank involved in this, then we might have an outside chance, all right? We can't afford a culture war. We can't afford the kind of polarization. We can't afford for each side to be d dismissing 50, 60% of the population because they're X or Y. Um, and this is why the polarization is so uh, dangerous. This woman, Ali um, Hostchild, and, uh, has anyone read this book? Get the audio version, because she's, uh, she's just brilliant. She's a feminist, she's a sociologist, she's the best sociologist in America, and she wrote this book. And she did, she did what all sociologists should do. She was wondering why all those buggers in Louisiana, poor white people, were voting for the Tea Party and getting enthusiastic about it. But instead of just writing op-eds and slagging them off as being deplorable or smelly or or, you know, whatever, g gun crazy. She actually went and lived with them for two years. And she was in her 60s, I guess. And, like, it was, a, you know, she up sticks, went for two years. And she tells an anecdote, which I think tells you an awful lot about the problem. And the anecdote was this. There's these guys living on a bayou. And they've lived there for nine generations, eating frogs and fish. Lots of recipes and uh, real intergenerational continuity. And in the last 15 years, about 20 of them have died of cancer. All right? And they're crazy about the Tea Party. And upstream, nine miles up the stream, there's a bloke who for 30 years, his job has been to take a specially modified lorry and illegally dump toxic sludge into the river. Right? And he knows it's a shit job. He's a wildlife guy. He likes hunting and fishing. And one day there's a bird flying across. And uh, the bird just drops. It goes over the lorry and it just drops out of the sky, lands on the bonnet. And uh, being a nice guy, picks it up and gives it the kiss of life because it's so toxic and the bird flies off. Anyway, the company, being a big, bad, Acme kind of petro company, let him go. He's on oxygen. His health is deteriorated from handling all this shit. And she goes to him and she says, why are you still enthusiastic about the Tea Party who are protecting all these oil interests? And he said, look, I went out in a fishing boat after I got laid off and I'm living on nothing. I'm going out fishing and I dropped a little bit of gasoline into the water. And the bloody EPA man comes up and slaps me with a $5,000 fine. I can I swear? Are we good with that? Um, this is verbatim, right? No, I won't swear. <laughs> Think of my mum. All right, he says, the effing EPA man, he knows what I've been doing for 30 years. Every bloody week I've been taking sludge and putting it in the, the, the river 
and the people down the road who are my uh, uncles and aunts and things, are, they're dying of cancer. They know what we do, and they do nothing about it. But some little guy, little guy, you always get that phrase, little guy comes up and drops some petrol in the water, and it's a $5,000 fine. And so I hate the corporations. But you know what I hate worse? I hate Hillary Clinton and I hate the bloody fed, the feds. All right? Now, you can have an intellectual argument about whether he's right to have that, but those feelings are there and they're driving politics in the States, they're driving politics in the European Union, and so you have to engage with them. Um, and I think what's going on is this. This is one of Katie's slides. Brilliant job, Katie. Um, so <laughs> this is what we call the ideological omnibus. She's very, very modest. Um, this is what happens, the issues get tied together, right? And so you, you take them as a package, and never have they been more kind of omnibus than, than in the present situation. So you're having an argument with someone on this side, and you think you're having an argument about climate change, and they're a climate skeptic, and they're probably a creationist as well. You're not having an argument about climate change, you're having an argument about pro-life, right? It's just that you, you think you're having an argument about climate change. And whilst those issues, are, whilst we're packaging those issues, it's very comfortable for us on this side because we've got a package of virtues that we can sell and flag and, 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 and be right on every single issue. But it means that we can't engage with people on this side and any commonality is lost. But it turns out that uh, if, you start, um, if you forget about the omnibus and start taking it issue by issue, there are things that you could agree on. Because some people want less state and something about family and Jody's all about family and, and, and she wants more community and organic farmers. And if you actually look at it, um, I spent a lot of time studying the transition movement through a microscope, wondering what was going on. And uh, the kind of people at transition are doing very similar things to Christian preppers. You didn't know about Christian preppers, did you? <laughs> the organic prepper, she's got a site and she makes anti-mosquito stuff out of tomatoes and... I don't know what. Anyway, she's just as much a hippie as the people on this side, except she's got a gun, all right? But they're doing very similar things, and if they sat down and shared a latte, they might actually find that, apart from this, the pro-life stuff and some of these other omnibus issues, that they had some common ground. So we had this conversation. This isn't Green Party politics. I don't really know Paul. We've never met. We were like ships in the night, but we drank a bottle of whiskey, and he was whinging, like the bloody act. They always whinge. Oh, God, oh, it's badly in the election. How are we going to get some? And I said, it's easy. All you've got to do is have Frank in mind. And I told him about Frank already and showed him some video. I said, all you've got to if you can get Frank on side, uh, then you'll win a landslide. It'll be a green populist revolution. And he said, how would you do that? And I said, well, forget the cities for starters, because you're always going to be squeezed between the, the liberals and the NDP, because they're playing the same mood music. It's hard to get a, you know, a Rizzler paper between uh, the, the, the parties for the public. I know that you're, you, you have lots of big differences with them, but it's not perceptible to most people. They're all kind of you know, light greens. Um, downplay, this is unpopular, I know, downplay the woke politics of intersectionality. It's not that you have to leave it behind personally, but you have to recognize that if you start up a climate action conference with a discussion about pronouns, that's great but you're not speaking to the people in Alberta. So if you want to speak to each other, that's fantastic. But if you want to speak to Frank, he would just walk out the room at that point. Now, you can make what you like of that, but if you've only got 13 years and you want Frank on board, and he's got nine incredibly powerful sisters, so don't piss him off, um, then, then you, have to, you, have to just, you have to bear it in mind. That's all you have to do. What are we about? We're about electoral seismology. I made that up. That wasn't yours. Good, isn't it? Um, it's about shifting the tectonic plates, disengaging low- and middle-income, rural, small-town conservative voters from automatic support or identification with corporate interests. I often, driving along, why the hell do they identify with Tim Hortons? What is there to like about... Oh, I know, I'm getting my citizenship. I roll that back, can we cut that bit? I love Tim Hortons. <laughs> All right, why do they do it? Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, they're not Canadian anymore. Well, well spoken, I can say that now. How do we do it? We do it by generating legitimation capital. It's a sort of Habermasian term. Um, that's to say, through real economic and cultural support for communities and households and freedom for what a lot of people perceive as an intrusive state and an ideologically partisan state and ideologically partisan institutions. If you're part of the CBC, by the way, I guarantee you, you're going to have a tax revolt because the CBC speak to literally 5% of the population and everybody else either switches it off and puts on the country radio. Um, 
uh, they don't buy into it. And so that's a dangerous policy for public sector broadcasting. Um, so you, 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 you have to go in the direction of legitimation. So, and then the, the, corp, the, the capitalist thing. You know, Frank would define himself as a capitalist. So he's got no money and he's, got a, you know, he's running a small business and whatever. But if you're just anti-capitalist, there isn't this off-the-peg replacement for capitalist modernity. And capitalism's brought a lot of good things as well as a lot of bad things. Um, so you have to be more nuanced about it. So talk about capitalism, but talk about family, talk about community, and talk small. And remember that all of the visions that are coming out of this conference, all I haven't heard any actually an total anti-market ones. People are talking about small embedded markets and marketplaces and forms of economic life which are more face-to-face, um, -face, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then you've got to invert the regulatory pyramid, another fine one from Katie. Um, look at that, it's beautiful. This is a, a diagram which just shows you what, what it looks like, the, 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 the landscape at the moment. This is the size, so at the top, the, on the, uh, the, the x-axis, large and small, and then the width of this, this triangle represents the unit transaction costs. Right? So if you're um, at the top, if you're Canadian Tire or Tim Hortons and you've got a team of a thousand lawyers, doesn't matter, you're not sweating at all. You can do anything you like, any change in government regulations, it's no sweat, there is zero transaction costs. If you're at the bottom, right, you're in trouble because the unit, this is, um, that's my sister, it's not. <laughs> it, but I wish it was because that's exactly what she looks like. She runs a small brewery. If you ever go to Northeast England, Colourcoats Brewery, it's the best bitter in the land and it's God's country, so it's gotta be good, all right? It's a tiny brewery, two people. That's why I was interested to go to the panel on breweries the other, the other day. But when it comes to audit time, because it's alcohol, you know, she might as well be peddling, you know, RPGs or, uh, I don't, <laughs> like, like, it, because it's alcohol, this, and th that's what it looks like. It's two weeks of absolute hell. If they find a, a spare bottle, uh, you know, hidden under the, the bathroom seat or some, something, um, then they're out of business. And Ontario is even worse. It's like East Germany as far as the alcohol is concerned. That's just a, you know, tip there, policy. Um, this is uh, audit time at Molson's. They don't have any of those problems. They just sleep through it. They ring up the beer store occasionally and say, how much are we ripping off the Ontario public? And the beer store is good. We've got millions of dollars. Oh, fantastic. Off we go. <laughs> there we go again. If you want to try something in the Ontario countryside, my experience of it is that it, it's kind of dead. You walk through its agribusiness, there's nothing going on. And, and I suddenly realized, now living in rural Ontario, why? Because it's really bloody difficult to do anything. It's really, really hard. You want to do a bunkhouse like this, and you think you'll do it on a, you'd set up a bunkhouse in your old barn, and it'll be on a, a you know, an honesty box, right? And then suddenly, you know, you've got to have training and tax and accessibility rules and planning and insurance and health and safety. It's a nightmare. Maybe you want to do a bit of distilling. That's mine and Aaron's project. Aaron's my mentor in making things, right? And we want to have a go distilling. Now, we can distill, all right? And, and Nikki says, as long as we do it at least 100 yards from the house, she's cool if we die. Right? And that's fine, but we can't sell it. Right? If you want to sell it, absolutely forget it. That's a monopoly tied up with Molson's and uh, the beer store and the LCBO. What about unpasteurized milk? Paul was telling me this story. If you're caught on the motor, like he was getting some unpasteurized milk, it was like trying to, you'd be better off, it's easier to buy a tank in America than it is to get unpasteurized milk in Ontario. And he's driving down, and the, and the guy said, if you're driving down the motorway and you get stopped by the police, tip it out of the window, because if, if, you, if the policeman smells it, and it does stink, Right, especially the goat stuff, then we're out of business. All right? It's just a cow. People have been doing that for 10,000 years. It's blinking dairy products, yogurt. It's not rocket science, but you can't do it. How about this? People have been doing this, growing their own livestock, killing them on site, which, by the way, is a lot, less, uh, a lot more friendly to the pigs than transporting them thousands of miles from Texas in the back of a horrible, stinking lorry, and selling the meat, eating it, sharing it amongst their family, and selling it at the farm gate or the local farmer's market. Slaughterhouses are, are, are closing all over Ontario, small ones, in favor of big ones. And if you try and do this, right, we were thinking, well, you know, we did some uh, chickens and the, the kids, they were actually surprisingly robust in the way they, um, what a different story. But uh, it's really, really hard. You can't do it. How about this? This is not a green policy, but you've got to, if five minutes, I know, I'm getting there. Um, you want to import some strange vehicle, ex-Swiss Army Pinsgauer, and make a very cool camper out of it. Right? How many people would actually do this or import a car from Japan? Not very many, but you guys could get a lot of credit amongst the petrol heads if you just lightened up a bit about insurance for old school buses and stuff like that. Um, but I in every way, the state's in the way. Or, a co or, or setting up a festival or a campsite or doing anything like this. Um, 
There they are again. We tried to get a barn going. We wanted to build a barn out of wood, which was on our lot. Uh, and we were going to chop the trees down and process them. But you have to get it certified by a proper drying company in order to get planning permission. And so the price went up and then all of the rules were because it was going to have children in it. And you can't do it on a buyer beware thing. If you, buy, if you build the barn, it's got to be done to, to regs and that's going to cost you. It was, they, would, they, they, they said, with no joke, they said 700000 So that's what it looks like. And as a result, when you if you ever do go into rural Ontario, it's a kind of desert. There's nothing going on. So we don't want that. What we want is this. We want to invert that regulatory pyramid so that the cost of doing business at the bottom is zero. If you've got a kitchen and you want to do a restaurant, if you want to do some unpasteurized milk and processing and home slaughter, if you want to keep a crow, I know it's not popular, but there's no reason why the state should be saying this woman can't keep a pet raven if she finds one for a pet. That's a rule you can do without. And it would get you one more vote. The weird raven lady <laughs> of Sudbury. Rural development, the same kind of principles, radical subsidiarity, radical presumption of uh, freedom of action, a presumption against federal restrictions, embedded small scale. Basically, this is about legitimating and freeing up ordinary people to use the means of production that they already have. They've got a kitchen, they've got a, a cooker, they've got a, they can keep a couple of co goats in the back garden. Um, we'll come to this in the, the, the questions, but you can't, the, the other thing that you have to attend to if you're going to get Frank on board is civic nationalism. You have to have a civic national project. And you should be aware, for all the people who are sort of spitting on anything to do with the nation state, the nation state and the Keynesian welfare state go hand in hand. If you like childcare and health and medical services and, and translation services and legal aid, then you're depending on something to do with uh, civic nationalism. Um, we'll come to that in the... Uh, um, so the payoff, the payoff is if you go in this direction, and you tailor a set of policies, a libertarian set of policies aimed at the countryside, I think you'll find it much easier than you think to disengage those um, rural conservatives, people like Frank, from automatic affiliation with kind of big capital, sort of traditional conservative uh, policies. And you'll start, they'll start accepting things like carbon tax, public transport, road, pr uh, road pricing, disincentives for air travel, all of those things that you've been talking about um, for years. So, Paul. That's the question. What do you think? You, me, Elizabeth May, some music. If you're watching, Elizabeth, that's an invitation. We can do better than Fiddler's Choice. I just thought I'd put that in because it was local. I'll get some scotch if you come. And, and a barn. Um, and that's my question. Can, if we do, do this, can we pull those rural uh, conservatives on board and generate a green populist revolution? And I think if you want to do it in 10 to 15 years, then that's what you need. I'm done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. Annie, bonjour, Shula Malechem, good morning. I uh, would invite you to say good morning in a language that means something to you. Good morning. My name is Hannah Atkinson Renglich, and I'm extremely grateful and honored to be part of this panel today. I don't have as many jokes, and I have absolutely no slides, but I hope that you'll find something useful in, in what I have to contribute here this morning. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm an uninvited guest, and as well an invited guest, on uh, the stolen land that we're on today, the territory of the neutral, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg. Um, and I'm coming here today uh, having been born and raised on Dish With One Spoon Treaty territory. And my family have been uh, displaced for many generations. And so I often consider myself a double agent in the circles that I work within, um, living with the experience of intergenerational trauma in my own body and in my own experience. And I've had the good fortune of working uh, the last several years with indigenous communities across Turtle Island through a wonderful project called the 4 Rs Youth Movement. Um, I'm here today, however, as uh, the Learning and Engagement Manager with the Canadian Community Economic Development Network, and I'll speak a little bit more about what that means. Um, but before I do, I also would like to acknowledge um, two bold and beautiful Anishinaabe Kwe, who I worked alongside at the 4 Rs, who have helped me to trouble and to question a lot of the things that I arrived with into the community work that I was so fortunate to be a part of. 
um, and their names are Jessica Bolduk and Nikita Tababadung of uh, Batchawana First Nation and um, Wisoxing First Nation. I also want to thank all you as co-participants and the organizers as well. If we could get one more round of applause. That's a thankless job. <laughs> so I'll start by saying that I have been learning and unlearning about home for all of my 32 winters in creation. And I think that that's the thing that's drawn me into community work. Um, I had no idea that this is where I would land if you had asked me 15 years ago what I might be doing as a grown-up person on the planet. Um, but I've been following this path of community. And it started um, with food sovereignty work in India and in Costa Rica. And that led me to supporting cooperative development across the province of Ontario for five years in a really interesting historical moment where food and farming cooperatives in the realm of local and sustainable food production and distribution were flourishing across Turtle Island. And I happened to step into a role where it became my job to animate that network. And in five years, we grew from 12 co-ops uh, co-organizing to about 100 different groups across the province. Um, <laughs> kudos to them. Um, uh, it's really incredible to see today that they continue on in their good work as a network, and they've actually recently launched a Fair Finance Fund, which I would encourage you to check out, thinking about how ecological economics comes into being in practical ways for communities. That's a very tangible um, space where that group has been able to make an intervention that's affecting food and farming organizations across Ontario. So today I'm working in community economic development. Does anybody have any idea what that is? It's sort of an older term at this point. Maybe raise your hand if you've ever heard of CED. Okay, so it's kind of generational, you'll notice if you look around the room. Um, CED was a more popular term 20, 30 years ago, and there was more policy support for CED in different parts of the country. Uh, today, I think that CED is struggling to make itself understood once again. But the way I describe it is that we are working on community-owned and community-led economic development so that jobs and wealth stay in community, but that has a very distinct social and ecological implication for communities. So it's not just about people and economic well-being, but it's about the planetary health and environmental well-being as well. SEDNET, the organization that I work for, along with many organizations right now, is really grappling with the idea of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, recognizing that this is a key element of how we're able to do our work in communities. And if we are not relevant to individuals across a wide diversity of communities and politics and all sorts of stripes, we're not relevant. Um, and it's been a bit of a, maybe a red herring to think about doing equity and accessibility work as a piece of work unto itself. And I think I've just come to you from two days of theory of change work with our board and senior staff. And we're now starting to think a little bit harder about how to reorient the table, how to recenter the conversations so that the conversations we're having are relevant to everyone. And I think that in this room, that's probably a very easily digestible, easily received concept. If we're having conversations about life and death and about environmental well-being, then we're having conversations of interest to every human being on the planet. Um, I'm going to stop with the CED talk for a moment, and I'd like to share a story that I hope will illustrate a few points that I have to share, um, which comes from my time working with the four R's. Uh, in that role that I held, I was the national dialogue coordinator of um, a community of 24 young people from across the country. And it was our work within two years to follow the leadership of pairs of youth in different communities who were calling burning questions into conversation with their particular communities. And so I had the great fortune of ha getting to go all the way up to northern Manitoba to Oxford House First Nation at the leadership of two young people there who were uh, working inside of a fly-in community where Catholicism and Christianity was so deeply entrenched that uh, an elder in the community had lost her job for making reference to teachings during one of the days of work that she had. And the punishment for doing that was um, both losing her job but also being called into the band office every day for six months and read passages from scripture. So it gives you a little bit of a sense of 
how uh, colonialism is still alive and flourishing in, in many different parts of this country, and I think it's something we feel distanced from here in southern Ontario. But that reality led to uh, young people, in response as well to the suicide crisis happening in their community, to decide that now is the moment to try and call forward our teachings and our traditions and our ways of being that might give us some clues about how we walk into a very uncertain future, feeling that um, their elders who were afraid to share their teachings needed space from the young people to be invited in to offer what they knew. And it was an amazing thing to be there because we learned that the elders um, had knowledge of cultural artifacts that had been physically buried in different parts of the community, so hidden underground. And their ancestors, when colonizers arrived to their territory, were very brilliant and forward-thinking and knew that they may need these things again someday and that they would be safest hidden under the earth. And so for the elders to be able to share that with youth trembling. I remember watching grandmothers with their legs shaking as they talked about this very important cultural heritage that they have to offer forward. Um, it was just an incredibly beautiful thing to see the hunger that the young people had for that which is theirs, which is theirs to own. Um, and I want to tell this story in part to talk about how colonialism is so deeply intertwined with capitalism because the thing that was happening in that community as we were present for some very uh, sort of exciting new teachings with the young folks was that a mining uh, corporation was at the doorstep. And this corporation was playing into the fears of the elders around their um, the level of Christianity, actually. And they had been told that the areas that they were coming into mine, both for gold and diamonds, were possessed by evil spirits. And that that was enough to keep folks away from those areas so that the corporation could do its prospecting work. But then it was also enough to turn the minds of each of the elders on the band council to allow for potential work in the community. So those young folks who were there talking about plant medicines, talking about building bundles, um, talking about how to revitalize their way of being in the world are facing incredible forces that are so interlinked and yet so very real. It's not, it's not theory for them. It's, are we going to have our water disturbed, this incredibly pristine water where you can still dip a cup into the lake and drink from it directly in their community, and trying to think ahead to what would happen in two years from now if we were being mined for diamonds that we'll never get to see. I say this in part to say that in our theory of change work this week, we had a raging debate about um, the usefulness of the creation of new uh, solutions and alternatives against the urgency of harm reduction. And if we want to think about harm reduction as a community health measure, um, how many folks are familiar with the concept of harm reduction? Traditionally used in community health to do with addictions and substance use. and um, the premise is that you are reducing the negative consequences of something by addressing the conditions that create that issue. And so if we think about colonial harm reduction, I, Im I invite you to think about what that could look like and what could capitalist harm reduction look like in our communities. Because it is a life or death issue for many individuals and it's not a conversation we actually have time to sit down and have in wonderful conference settings, but it's a matter of what does this look like tomorrow? How do I make sure I have clean water to drink or enough food to feed my family? Um, and so this is all wrapped up in power and privilege. I think that there we understand maybe theoretically a lot of these concepts about how important it is to live with discomfort, rest in the uncertainty, um, trouble the comfortable and comfort the troubled. You may have heard some of these things before, but I'm actually inviting you to think deeper into how we can put some of these things into our bodies and sort of come out of our minds a little bit. You do a ton of incredible thinking and intellectualizing in the academy, and it's so critical for developing policy and pushing us further. But as human beings, I think you're all connected to the ground you walk on, to the families that are around you, to your own beating heart and emotions that are driving you in your everyday life. And I think it's important to stay connected and anchored through all of those different things that you own and carry so that you're able to do this work in a much more profound way. Um, in thinking about building and resisting side by side, 
I encourage us to think sort of beyond intersectionality and, and the politics of division and to think about allyship. And if we're gonna take it further, to think about accompliceship. And if we're gonna take it even further, what would be co-resistance? How much skin do you have in the game that you'd be willing to lay down in order to support communities whose lives are actually on the line today, who needed this sorted out 50 years ago, 100 years ago, because we're dealing with the compounding interest of economic injustice that's been ingrained in our communities for a long, long time. I come from a Jewish lineage on one side of my family, and there's a very strong concept that motivates me, which is tikkun olam, which is healing the world or repairing the world. Um, and it's not a suggestion that that's something we can do overnight. It may not even be something that we can do in our lifetimes, but we have a direct obligation to participate, to not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief, but to do justly now, to love humbly now, to walk with mercy. This may be a quote some of you are familiar with. Uh, we're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are we free to abandon it. This is something like keep printed and written all over the place because this is grim, dark work when you're doing it on the ground. And we need to become a little bit more hope punk in all of it because this is gonna be the thing that keeps us going. That sense of humor, that bottle of whiskey shared with a friend, that that day on the land, that time on your farm, whatever it might be for you to figure out what is that medicine that you carry for yourself and to be able to use that as much as you can to stay committed to the bigger cause. I think hospicing the crumbling systems is gonna become a bigger and bigger part of our work as we're building the alternatives. The grief work is a big part of what this is and acknowledging that we're all steeped in capitalism, we're steeped in colonialism and it benefits us and if we can see our privileges and our positionality and know that we are a part of the problem, I think only when we know we are a part of the problem can we become part of the solution. So I don't have any answers. I have a lot of questions and I have poetry because that's the thing I always carry with me. Um, I'd like to share with you, if you would have me, um, one, two little pieces of writing from this incredible book called Lifting Our Hearts Off the Ground and it's a poetic reinterpretation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People by a settler and an Indigenous woman, so Lila June Johnston and Joy DeVito. The UNDRIP puts our principles into the format of the numbed world. It begins to speak of the sacred. To achieve its goal, the numbed world must come into the format of the sweat lodge. For some things cannot be explained in words or written into books, they must be understood through the body. I will try to tell you about the person I love, the way they speak, the way they hold me, the way they love me too, but you will never understand love until you fall in love yourself. Only then will you understand its power, its beauty, its sanctity. These words are signs on the road telling you where to go. They are not the destination. So that's a translation of Article 38, which reads, States, in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples, shall take the appropriate measures, including legislative measures, to achieve the ends of this declaration. <laughs> um, I want to talk just a little bit more about tables. I think that this metaphor of tables is coming up all the time in this work right now about who's at the table. If you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. How can we widen the tables? And this week, I've had this... Um, this incredible metaphor of a table inside of a tent, like imagine a wedding tent out in a field somewhere. And not all tables are made equal. And the power of convening is actually quite an incredible power. And it's wrapped up in a lot of privilege as well. Whether you have a seat at the head table or the table that's beside the bathroom or the table that's hanging out of the overhang and getting rained on constantly, not all tables are the same. Um, and there's another brilliant little piece of writing in this book, which is a translation of Article 41 that I won't read. It says, we said we wanted a seat at the table. What we meant is we want you to come and sit by the river. The dichotomy of indigenous and non-indigenous is false. And only when we all realize our own indigenosity can we live as the equals we are. Thank you.
And uh, let me just start with a, a very simple uh, confession, because I believe confession is good for the soul. So two things. I don't like public speaking. <laughs> Second thing is, I've been here for the last two afternoons, and, and so far this morning, and I'm following these, uh, these folks, and I feel like a little bit of a mental midget in a, in a world of intellectual giants. I'm a pretty simple guy, and I, I like being simple. I, I actually understand it. So, so I'd, I'd like, to, uh, like to get into the Oxford story, but, but just before I do, I think it's important to understand where a person is coming from, and then you understand, or, or it, helps you help, it helps you understand uh, their thinking, and whether they're, sorry, whether they're right or wrong doesn't really matter. So, so I ask your indulgence for just a minute to, to share a couple of comments. First of all, as a farmer, I am by nature a conservative. A person who has clear understanding that we want to preserve the quality of life for future generations. Or more specifically, I understand the need to take care of the resources we enjoy and use now for the enjoyment in the future, or sorry, for the enjoyment of future generations. And uh, I make no apologies if that's my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and yours too. As a farmer, I clearly understand that if you take good care of the water, the soil, the air, the plants and the animals, they will take good care of you. Secondly, I'm a progressive conservative. I know that regardless of my hopes or desires, evolution will keep moving things forward, with or without me. And so one either moves forward to the next challenge, or you get left behind. See if I can make this work. The old Chinese proverb that those who cannot adapt to change are either dead or soon going to, soon going to be, would fit well into my understanding. So whether I like it or not, political leadership needs to continuously look at the challenges that are coming towards us. We need to begin to imagine solutions. And most importantly, we have to have the courage to enact them. It is fear that drives a lot of politicians from a lot of good decisions. For me, political leadership is not about the affordability of beer or the availability of cannabis. It's about, <laughs> it's about dealing with the real problems of social justice, climate change, aging populations, and shifting global economic realities connected to our current overconsumption of resources. So finally, final comment about me. As a local municipal politician, I stand here ashamed to say that in this age of populist politics that we have most definitely entered into, if you're looking for real leadership from our current governance model, you're probably going to be disappointed. So, let's see if I can get this to work. Oxford story. A few years ago, the public outcry against a private mega landfill proposed in Oxford was the impetus for the County Council discussion on what was really important to our community. The county invited the community to create a sustainability plan. Over the next 18 months, 15 individuals, and there was no politicians allowed, through broad public consultation, and input created the future Oxford plan. In this plan, which attempts to balance social well-being, a dynamic economy, and a healthy environment, there are 15 objectives and 70 initial action items. And these action items range from reducing poverty to reducing waste to moving to 100% renewable energy. You can Google Oxford County, uh, Oxford future, sorry, future Oxford plan, and it'll come up. To, uh, so the one that I'm going to talk about, and I haven't got time to talk about the rest, but I'd, I'd love to, but I'll, I'll just talk about the renewable energy plan. To achieve the 100% renewable energy goal, we created a community or committee of interested community partners that we now call the Smart Energy Oxford Group. And it's a very simple goal for them. It is to move us, Oxford County, from a primarily fossil fuel-based energy system to a renewable energy system by 2050, where at least, and this is the mandate, 
where at least 100% of the county's requirements can be produced through renewable and sustainable methods that are free of greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, we know that in Oxford, we export about half a billion dollars a year just to buy energy. And then we consume it, and then we rush out, and we, we spend another $500 million. Roughly a third of that energy is used for heating and cooling of homes. A third is used for transportation of people and goods, and about a third is used for manufacturing, agriculture, and personal use. Various studies around the world have shown us that between a third and two-thirds of all energy is actually wasted. So, before we concentrate on generation, conservation has to be job one. And we've begun by looking at both housing and transportation. Since the county has considerable control over social housing projects and because our tenants will reinvest any energy savings that they might have, we thought social housing projects were a good one to start with. We've invested in better quality social housing projects. We began, we began with by using the International Passive House Standard as our desired standard. Our first project is this one. Uh, in partnership with Indel, Indwell, was a retrofitting of a 120-year-old sock factory into 54 four to 500 square foot apartments. We've since added at the back of this building 26 new units. Last year, the average heating and cooling cost for each of these units for the year is $54. That's $5 a month. This building uses a deep aquifer heating, heat exchange system. Since then, we've uh, we built, this building will open in the next few days. We built a 34 unit new build to Passive House Standard, where our anticipated heating and cooling cost per unit will be $3 a month. Next month, in, conjunct excuse me, <coughs> in conjunction with Tilsonburg Housing Co-op, we'll open this 16-unit single-story apartment for seniors. These are for seniors that are struggling. Uh, it's built to U.S. Passive House standard, primarily so we could use more local products, such as doors and windows, and it will have a solar PV rooftop. The building will be net zero, with an anticipated total energy cost for each uh, apartment uh, between $3 and $5 a month. That includes usage and delivery for all the energy they use in that, house, in that apartment. These are 600 square foot units. Our next housing project, which will break ground in the next couple of days, will be a 220 unit apartment and township, sorry, townhouse complex that's actually a mixed market building. And just last uh, month, I didn't do that, uh, just last month, <laughs> County Council also voted to build another 35 units uh, to Passive House Standard, which, uh, um, which will be carbon free as well. So while in the social housing project sector, we can move to these much higher standards, we must now focus on individual units. We're looking at an opportunity that would see us build a subdivision of mixed market housing in the near future built to the US Passive House standard. The challenge there is that because uh, we have limited opportunity to enforce building code improved, sorry, standards in the private de development community that is governed by the pathetic, did I say that? Sorry. <laughs> it's, gover it's, it's governed by the Ontario Building Code, which while <laughs> gradually improving, and, I, and I, I give them credit, they're gradually improving, they're only 20 to 30 years out of date. Despite encouragement from Oxford, and I have had personal conversations with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the province seems reluctant to encourage innovative thinking that would make better built environment a reality, even though it would be good, and for the Ontario people, for the people. <laughs> yes, this higher quality construction costs a little bit more. But on a recent Tilsonburg project for seniors, the construction supervisor suggested that it would cost 3% more in labor because, and I quote, you have to be more careful, really. In addition, as part of the, uh, oops, 
In addition, as part of the uh, county zero waste program, we built a new administration and education center at the, at the landfill, which is net zero, along with all the other buildings of the landfill. Uh, the new office building, or education building here, uses 70% less than the building be before it, uh, the previous building, and it's twice the size. In construction, oh sorry, one more comment. The, uh, the return on investment in these projects, on all of these projects, is uh, between five years and 20 years. I don't think that's too long for buildings that will last 50 or 60 years. And construction division is clear, building better is the only way Oxford is going to go. Any public building, this will be the direction we're going. On the transportation front, we're working on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the short term and moving towards alternate non-fossil fuel energy in the longer term. Currently, about 20% of our fleet of light vehicles has been converted to compressed natural gas, which sees a 20 to 25% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Not good, but better than doing nothing. Oxford purchased the first two CN, oh, sorry, compressed natural gas snowplow trucks in Canada, and we've had some challenges with them, but we'll, we'll get them figured out. In addition, we purchased the first two hybrid ambulances in Canada in 2017, bought two more in 2018, bought three this year. With the recent provincial announcement of the realignment of the ambulance services, we're unsure where we're going for future purposes, purchases, but we're eager to move to fully electric ambulances in the next two to three years. That's a possibility. We should be there. And while I'm convinced hydrogen is currently the best choice for the, for the longer term, we need to move to alternates now, and that requires a shift to electric. Oxford only has one electric hybrid and one fully electric car in our fleet, but we have developed in conjunction with QTRIC, the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Committee, a full EV charging master plan for the whole county. We have almost 30 county public uh, EV charging stations and another 50 to 60 private stations either running or in the, in the development stage in the county. In the next few months, we'll be building two more uh, level three fast charge stations in communities that don't have them and eventually every community will have a fast charger. So, did I, oh, that's, sorry, missed, a, missed the slide. So I want to finish, and, and I could talk for another hour about things we're doing in Oxford. I'd love to talk about reforestation and zero waste and all that, but I, and zero poverty, but I'm not going to, I'll, I'll just move on. I want to talk about a couple of challenges I see, and, and these are very simple. They're, they're way below your level, so don't worry about them. First, I see compressed natural gas is a very, a very small improvement. It's not something that I, I wave the flag about. It's, it's a little baby step. It's better than no step, but it's a baby step. The county's also looking at renewable natural gas, and particularly hydrogen. On our work on zero waste, we'll need to include the removal organics from the waste stream, and there are a number of options and they range from building a purpose-built building to capture the energy, to biogenerators, to alternating, or alternating our waste water plants to receive larger amounts of organics. There's a, there's a number of options, we're looking at them all. I'm not sure which one will come. But we've got to capture the energy out of waste, and uh, especially organic waste. This will be expensive, and in fact, we're having this debate at County right now, and it will test the resolve of our council. Tomorrow is not going to be cheaper than today. And if you want a landfill, that's the cheap way, it's the dirty way, and it's the way that the system wants to go. It is going to take some courage and it's going to take some encouragement from the public to make it happen. Second, oops, I was supposed to put that up. So fossil fuels to future fuels, that's, that's one challenge. The second one, I think, is that we, uh, we need to change our perceived reluctance or our sense of reluctance. I often hear people say that our conservative farmers will never move away from diesel-powered tractors, trucks, and combines. Despite the fact that they farm more than 400,000 acres in Oxford, farming consumes directly, just for, for energy use, 4 to 5 percent of the purchased energy in the county. It's, it's not our biggest challenge. 
And farmers are by nature some of the most progressive business people and staunch environmentalists there are. I am convinced that they are not our problem. And I say that because they will impact, uh, they, sorry, they will experience the impact of climate change first and most directly. And that's true of farmers everywhere in the world. They see it first and they know what it's, they're going to understand it best. And finally, we all understand that societies are like all other living creatures. They evolve and they change. And so too must our political system. To meet the challenges of today and tomorrow, we need to reimagine or rethink how we want politics to work, to resolve issues instead of creating them. The day of first past the post, elections and partisan platforms packed with hostile slurs and innuendo needs to come to a close. To face the enormity of the problems we face, we all need to commit ourselves to finding solutions instead of finding faults. We as citizens are better and deserve better than the political games currently being played because I think our future depends on it. I believe that the old adage that you get the government you deserve is as true today as it's ever been. And if that's true, and if you want political leadership that will actually deal with the challenges we face for this and future generations, then we need to elect principled leaders instead of populist politicians. And that, ladies and gentlemen, can be your response. But it's definitely your responsibility. Thank you. Edge for farmer. <coughs> Pardon me. So that was an incredible range of positions and experiences, uh, and yet I found as I was listening a lot of commonality in values and, uh, and solutions. And some of the things that came up, I heard reciprocity. I heard reciprocity from Stephen when he talks about engaging in his cultural traditions and getting out and being on the land and fiddle dancing with his family. And I hear reciprocity in Hannah's indigenous work. Uh, and I hear reciprocity you know, when you talked about um, farmers by nature being conservative, but then you described the relationship with the land and understanding that in order to take from that land, there is a giving. And like, for me, that's, that's absolutely uh, amazing to come out of s such a range of experience and arrive at centralized values. I heard direct democracy happening in your community, and that's exactly what a lot of the more radical voices uh, at this conference have called for as a way of moving past first past the post and top-down decision making where no politicians got in a room and community members got together and decided what a plan might look like. And that is absolutely radical, small c conservative politics. Mm -hmm. And it's not that different from radical, small l uh, politics, which brings me to sort of a central idea. I think we continue to discuss this binary as if it's a relevant model for our politics and yet Stephen's diagram showing the omnibus left-right binary and then destroying that, showing that really there are different places in this. And in an ecological economy, we don't have room for linear binaries. And I kind of want to throw that out as a statement back to the panel for folks to maybe comment on how useful is this conversation really around right-left when we're looking at the, the sorts of things we're taking on now, maybe as an entry point, but we get to, to determine what models we use for our, our conversations as a society. And so I wanted to put out to you, what is the, really the relevance of this conversation around the right? And are we tying ourselves to a binary in that way? Is there a way around that could, that could maybe help us reach to people where they are at their shared values if we just really abandon that false concept? And maybe I'll, uh, I'll ask Paul to comment first and then we'll go David, Hannah, and Stephen. Thanks. <laughs> On the spot, you <laughs> came as the poli political guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really liked 
it's reaching people where they're at. And what I'm learning about politics, and David knows this better than I do, that you're knocking on doors, so you have to have this conversation with people face to face and put your platform, your policies forward so that they vote for you. So how do you reach the people when, you know, like David brought up, that we kind of were deserving the governments that we're voting in now? Yeah. And, and the, the like it almost seems like society needs to to wake up and there this is where I, one of the presenters yesterday was talking about mindfulness and it, it just feels like there, there's such a disconnect now where people are at so you know how do we actually get into power of s to implement these changes so I, I I don't know if I can answer that one like any other thoughts on that on this notion? I mean, you, you live in a community where strongly people identify inside of this conversation when they see it in the news, there might be like, is it really useful in the work that you're doing? Or are we wise to maybe as a society move beyond this binary in, in this conversation? Okay, so we have the same problem in Oxford, everybody else does. Uh, um, first of all, we have, in, and we have it here, we have a, a wonderful group of people come together, really committed to something. And and then the masses out there are very different, right? They're, they're actually worried about how do I get home tonight from work and do I have enough money to buy groceries and, and go to the, to the show and whatever, right? And, uh, but I think that's where leadership to me is important. Somebody has to have the guts to stand up and say, this is where we have to go and this is why we have to do it. And, and you have to be able to bring people along. And uh, I think that's one of the challenges. And we also get into this partisan political divide about I really don't care what the other party says. They're just wrong. What a pile of crap. They're no more wrong than I am. They're just different. And I think we've, we've got to get past that. And we don't have time, quite frankly, to fool around calling each other names and, and pointing out everybody's faults. Yeah. We've got to get to work. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> skip the clapping. Nobody gives a shit about your clapping. Let's just get to work, <laughs> right? We haven't got time to fool around. And I, I don't actually care. I'm, I'm really talking about my children, my grandchildren, your children, their, gran their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. If we don't do something, we're, we're destroying their future. And I don't think that's a legacy that anybody in this room wants to leave. I want something better. I want, and this with all respect to our, our First Nations folks, I want them to look back at their ancestry and say, at one point in time, they finally did it right. They let go of all the crap and moved in the right direction. That's what we need to do, every one of us. And, and we each need to do it. So anyway, sorry, I wandered off. It's okay, Hannah, do you have any comments? Or? Yeah, I really appreciated the comment about principled leadership. And it's something that's coming up a lot in uh, community sectors right now because there are sort of old boys networks, for lack of a better word, who um, have articulated things long ago and then had definitions sort of set in stone or things become encrusted. And there's new energy and young people who are hungry to get into the work but don't understand what those old boys networks are talking about. And because they've already taken the time to articulate things, are not necessarily willing to open up the conversations again. But it is so important to say what we stand for so that people have things to react to. And we're not being dismissive because of partisan politics, but because we actually maybe don't agree with that value that you have. And so I think it's calling on us all to speak in really plain language as much as we can, to say what we mean so people have things to react to, and so that people know where they need to be, and if that's not what is fitting with their intention around action and change, they can go find another place to contribute their energies. Um, and I, I appreciate your comments too about intergenerational equity. We have to do this for the future generations. We also have to do this for the people who've already been left behind and who are struggling and dying today because of what's happening. And I think that the privileges and the positionality we have of having power, whether it's leadership, whether it's being in the academy with time to think and to plan, means we have more responsibility to name what we're doing so that people who are just hustling to get through their days and their lives don't have to also add that to the labor that they have in the world to make it through. So yes, and. Right. Mm -hmm. And Stephen, do you have a quick comment on this before we move on to the questions? Wait. 
<laughs> okay, it's yeah, I do. Okay, I put this diagram around, and uh, uh, Katie hates these diagrams. She didn't really do them. I did them. They're brilliant. Um, th th I think what, from a soci from a sort of historical sociological point of view, what people often don't understand when they're involved in the argy bargy of left and right politics, which I was for thirty years is that if you wanted to define what modern societies are and what they did in, in, in one way, it, it's basically the, 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 emer the replacement of place-bound um, forms of economy and society, in which there isn't an economy separate from society and ritual and religion, embedded forms of living, livelihood, family, with the state and the market. And the state and the market require each other. Right? American libertarians are very funny. They think if you get rid of the, the state, you'll be left with a society of individuals with, you know, all armed to the teeth. You won't. You'll be left with tribes. Right? Th that's what the state and the market replace. They replace tribes. And, and the thing is that, that the, st the state requires fiscal flows from a growing economy. Just hands up here, who's in favor of uh, extending childcare? Right? All of you. All right. If you're involved, if you want to extend childcare, it has to be paid for from a growing economy. It has to come from fiscal resources transferred. So, so, so if you if you're attached to the welfare state in that way, you're part of the same. You're on the same team. And, and the biggest challenge, if if Nordhaus was right, then you can just green that top diagram. You can just green it, and it looks the same. You've got a survival unit, which is basically individuals relating to the nation state and the market, and families aren't that that important. If you're a McDonald now in Fergus, and you're unemployed, and you banged on someone's door and said, hey, you're a McDonald, and I'm a McDonald, and so I'm unemployed, so I'm going to sleep on your sofa because we're part of the same family, they'd say, bog off. You can either go and get a job, that's the, the labor market, or you can go and get unemployment benefit from the state, because your survival unit is the individual plus the state and the market. If um, Callis is right, and we're in for a period of sustained contraction and degrowth, that entire model is in crisis. And that means that every single thing that you value, which depends on the welfare state, is in trouble. So for, you know, you've got to rethink how your health systems work, rethink what childcare means. And one thing is that the family and community, which is why there's a link to the kind of indigenization or what an indigenous modernity would look like, that I call it livelihood from Polanyi, but you can call it what you like, will grow. And if that grows, then a lot of the sort of gut instincts of these people on the other side who you're, I mean, um, American conservatives, they don't really have that kind of language that they have in Britain between sort of Burkean conservatives who are more kind of, you know, I think in your territory, and, and liberals, classic liberals who are about the market. And, and the, 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 com the, 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 the discourse is dominated by anti-neoliberalism or anti-neocons, but there are conservatives, even in America, big raft of conservative opinion, which are all about family, community, and reciprocity. And um, if, if Cal I think most people here are probably on Callis's side of the, the debate. You're kind of degrowthers or steady state people, or I mean, you're in an ecological economics conference, so I guess you're concerned about scale. Uh, and if that's right, then, and you were talking about a livelihood politics, then there is more space between you and the, the, the sort of policy intuitions of social democrats for the last 40 years than there is between you and many conservatives. And so a name which I would throw into that space is someone like Wendell Berry. It doesn't make sense to think of Wendell Berry as a social democrat or a liberal or a, you know, a neocon. He's someone who's standing for a different kind of economy. And that's not necessary. I mean, there's, there's good stuff which comes with that, which we have all identified in a way. There's a lot of bad stuff as well. Well, I would push back a little bit on the premise that the only way to achieve uh, social, uh, the, the social goals of things like uh, universal child care is through the state is to, to predicate that the natural unit of organization is the nuclear family and that the state is the thing that um, is... Not necessarily it, it, Let me family. finish, that the state is the thing that's managing the relationship between us and our former collective lives. But if we point to the kind of community that David is speaking to or the community that I heard from Hannah or the community that you're creating with the folks that you're creating, there are a range of other options than we have to sort of return to some false idea of a pre-state society as next. But we're not going to get into a debate about it here. We're going to go for a drink after at 10.30 in the morning to have that one. We're uh, in but I would like to, what, what I'd like to do, we can now. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask some questions from the floor, and I'm going to start with one for David. Uh -oh. And I am sorry, I'm going to have to hold it out a little because I didn't bring my reading glasses. You got some? Great. Thanks. Old people. 
I'm still in denial that I'm an old person. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, what, what's the demographics of your area? Are the people in your county supportive of these projects? Would they vote green? And what might they say to Stephen's call to allow for more homebrew and a less traditionally liberal agenda? So read the question slowly and I'll give you an answer quickly. I'll give you the first part. Your demographic. Demographics, 110,000 people, uh, pretty average, probably aging a little bit faster, very rural, very conservative. No, they don't vote green. Okay, and would they support these projects? Uh, that's leadership. If the government says we're going this way, uh, and, I, and I, think if the, I think in general, yes. I think the, the sense that we are incredibly fortunate we are blessed beyond uh, you know, belief, really, in, in this part of the world. Um, most people realize we have a, a responsibility to do better for the future, so okay. yes. I think there's lots that are opposed. Like, we, we get lots of... And so is the leadership, is, would you say that it's based on folks trusting you or trusting other councillor members on a personal level? That it's there, they, there's a trust that's placed in there? Or there? Are they paying attention to the kinds of policies? If the bill goes up to meet them, does it become a problem? I think there's a trust. I also, like a, at municipal level, I think you get away with that a little more. I also think, though, that it's simply two or three people get together and say, uh, we think we should do this and have the courage to stand up and, and sort of push the, the agenda forward. Uh, I, I'm a great believer in Margaret Mead. It only takes a small group of people to change the world. Yeah. We, don't, we don't need, you know, 10 billion people or 8 billion people to decide that we got to change. We just need a few leaders that say we're going to change and then actually demonstrate change. Great. Thank you. Sorry. So, Stephen, for you, uh, how do we find affinities between greenness and solidarity with a range of people's views, for instance, like Frank in Ontario, when the lens you are using in which we accept implicitly as a society, Western modernity is the only unchangeable universal way of thinking and being? This question is relevant since your lens instantly alienates the lived experiences of other black and brown bodies, many of whom have, have and do reside in Ontario, and whose worldviews have been and continue to be violently erased. Well, I, 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 I've never ever said that the Western worldview is, is the only view in town. I would never say that. I mean, I, I think that's nonsense. The thing is that depending on which path you go down, there are good things and there are bad things. So if you're, if you're tied to, uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of things which came out of capitalist modernization which people are deeply attached to. Um, the, the, the fact that, um, the, I mean, oh God, I, we, we, I could go on for ages. The, the relationship between energy and complexity is such that there are forms of complexity which require, have required growing economies. If you want to um, move in the other direction, I mean, I think moving from a balancing the nation and the nation state and the market with a much broader role for a livelihood economy is moving precisely in Hannah's direction. Um, but the danger is that if you go in that direction, there are, other, there, are, there are political problems and challenges which go with that. So I don't, I mean, I just think that, that, that whoever's writing that question is, is sort of throwing, um, they're hearing what they want to hear, and I'm playing the part of the pantomime villain. I'm good at that, I like it. But, um, but read more carefully, I would say, because I, I don't recognize that in anything that I've written. Okay. I'm going to ask a question uh, first to Hannah, and then I'm going to put it out to Paul. Saul Alinsky said, if having long hair is a barrier to communication, the activist cut his hair. How do we stay true to our, large, uh, our larger social justice commitments and convictions while being wiser with how we communicate across the kind of political barriers we talked about this morning? Can you read that again? I can. <laughs> so... Saul Alinsky said, if having long hair is a barrier to communication, the activist cuts his hair. Mm. So how do we stay true to our larger social justice commitments and convictions while being wiser with how we communicate across the kind of political barriers we talked about this morning? You don't have to accept Saul's uh, conviction around that. So mm -hmm. that the invitation is to sort of discuss, you know, how do we present ourselves in our communication in a way that might broaden our audience by reducing some of the obvious barriers that uh, may be visual barriers or verbal barriers for people understanding what it is we're trying to communicate. I think that's such an individual response. Um, and I think that in terms of communication, uh, what I practice is communicating with kindness 
and hope that the folks who need to hear what I have to say are able to digest some of it. And if my appearance might be a barrier to others, that's a shame. But I think that we're in a time where we have to be able to look right through and be able to hear what people are saying and across all kinds of divisions and appearances because that is where some deep wisdom will be lying. And that is right beyond the human as well. Like if we're able to go to the land and to the water and to understand the teaching that it has to offer us, we're in a much better place to do our work as human beings together. So I think if you need to cut your hair, cut your hair, but I would say be who you are as, as as much as you can. I think that full self-expression is an important part of the work that we have to do together. Thanks. Paul, do you have any comments? Thanks for the question. Uh, the, the nice thing about the, the Green Party is it's an international party. So there's Greens all around the planet. And we have guiding principles. So in our the way we go forward is we can't go outside of our principles. So at least that keeps us honest and on. But saying that, with, with the time that we have left ecologically, you know, we do need to reach out to a, a broader audience. But at the same time, we can't go away from our principles and our values. So we have to remain true, like Hannah was saying. But at the same point, like what David was saying, just trying to meet people where they're at. And we all know, you know, outside of our, our bubble that we're in here, that people are suffering out there on this, you know, just to make ends meet or to get home to, you know, do the kids' homework, get bath them, you know, put them to bed, sort of thing. So it's like, it, it's it's that's, you know, the the tricky part is how do we meet them where they're at to get them to vote for you? Because yes, leadership is such a key part, and and I agree. But and just having a vision that maybe people can vote for, but then at the same point time. Everyone is so inherently selfish that they're only looking at mm -hmm. their own needs, so they, they will vote for the, the quick solutions that are meeting them at their needs. So, like, how do you bridge that gap? I'm throwing a question back to the audience now, but, um, <laughs> you know, to meet people where they're at, but then to show the leadership of where we need to go and to get them to meet you. So I, that's what we're challenged with. Well, I'm aware that we're at 10.30, and as much as I would love to continue with questions, and there's a whole bunch of things that were thrown out, premises that were made, challenges that didn't happen. Uh, one of the things that I do want to draw attention to is that when you're doing the work in the public, and I am an academic now, but I also come from a background, Hannah and I are old colleagues, and um, I've, I've worked in food sovereignty work here as well in the country over 20 years. When you're on the ground engaged, some of the challenging conversations we're having around moving past commodification, around shifting the basis of our economy from one of uh, destruction and exploitation to one of regeneration, that sounds like it's a conversation to have 50 years down the road. But I would really like to challenge us as we're moving forward as a society, and particularly over the next two years, what could we look to, to try to really imagine a completely different narrative that, that uh, it might not feel like it's on a realistic timeline, but on September 20th, Greta and the rest of the children around the world have called on each and every one of you to walk out of your job on that day. I don't care if it's your dissertation. I do not care if it's the day you are going for your tenure. I don't care if you're supposed to fly somewhere to present somewhere. Everyone, walk out on that day and see what might actually be possible beyond these sort of analyses we have that hold us to our lowest version of ourselves. Um, really, it's all we have is that kind of hopefulness. I'm gonna take moderator privilege and leave us on that note. I do invite you to track all of us down when we leave here. There's more conversation to happen. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your class.